Hey everyone, I'm back and this is episode two in which we are doing a review of Mastery, The Keys to Success and Long-Term Fulfillment by George Lennart. And um, so in the, previous, um, in the previous episode, I got into all this uh, talk about why Mastery is um, what George Lennart would call the, the most surefire way to live a fulfilling life. And um, we also touched on this idea of how to keep ourselves uh, energized in our pursuit towards mastery. Um, and we also mentioned what I think is, uh, at least to my mind, the most memorable um, teaching of this book, which is this idea that a master is someone who is um, comfortable spending long periods of time in what George Leonard calls the plateau which is this part of your um, path to mastery, which is characterized by a lot of practice and zero progress. And um, the, the main point that George Leonard makes about this is that um, if you are someone who enjoys practice for its own sake and you are uh, comfortable with the plateau and you enjoy the ritual of the practice and you are very mindful with every instance in which you come and practice your skill or your art, then um, then progress is sure to happen because progress happens to take place in, in spurts over time. So there's periods where you have a plateau but you keep practicing and being very mindful and then a little, uh, a little peak of progress comes and then you're on another plateau and so on. And um, and so, so rather than this expectation that your your skills should go up in a linear fashion, um, George makes a huge point about loving the plateau and how um, for those people who enjoy the plateau or that sort of uneventful um, um, stage in, in the practice or uneventful moments in life, life happens to be particularly rewarding because that's where most of life happens actually. So life has a few peaks uh, but uh, but a lot of plateau and so you're you're better off uh, raising your level of enjoyment of the plateau as opposed to expecting or trying to create one peak after the next and so um, and so today I was gonna touch upon or rather I am gonna touch upon um, three different personality types that uh, George Leonard mentions as uh, and antithetic to, to a, the achievement of mastery. And so it's what he calls the dabbler, the obsessive, and the hacker. Um, and he provides little, little curves uh, for, the, for the behavior of each of them. And so if you'll remember, the, the mastery curve was this one, which I just described, which is plateaus with the occasional upward uh, spike. And, um, but when it comes to, to these other personality types, it's, it's far different than that, right? So this is, the, this is the dabbler right here. And so the dabbler is someone who um, tries all kinds of different things and makes initial progress, but quits the moment the first setback um, appears. So, um, you know, this is, this is someone who uh, lacks, uh, let's say, lacks competitiveness and lacks the, the, the stamina and the determination to, to follow through. So this is someone very, very poor follow through um, skills. So um, yeah, so, so the, first, the first challenge comes and this person goes like, oh, this is actually not, not for me. You know, I expected this to be just like this magical um, uh, rainbow up to heaven and uh, it didn't pan out that way. Then you have the obsessive and the obsessive has a curve that looks more or less like this, okay? And so uh, the obsessive is the person who, uh, when, when they get into, into this whole thing, uh, they, um, they go all out at first. So they get all the gear, they get all the books, and, um, and you know, they, they also expect this peak after peak because in their mind, um, there's a linear relationship between the effort that they put in and the way progress presents itself. So the obsessive is someone who rather than getting discouraged at the first setback, uh, gets discouraged during the first plateau because when the first plateau appears, they redouble their efforts 
and when no improvement shows itself, then they, they just think like, nope, this is, this is not for me. Um, and I, uh, so the funny thing is I was, I was trying to figure out which one I suffer from, but I think that in different stages of my life and also in different, um, uh, pursuits that I've followed, I have, um, I have shown uh, several of these traits, right? Um, but it, it's, it's great to see them in print and to, um, and to read about it so that just by becoming aware that these things exist, then you, you can reflect upon that. So that if you're following a hobby that you thought you were quote unquote meant for, and uh, the, first, uh, the first challenge appears, uh, rather than, than thinking, oh, this is not for me, you think, oh no, I'm just, I'm, I'm just acting like a, like a dabbler right now. Or uh, if the first plateau appears, you redouble efforts, nothing happens, you start to think, um, okay, maybe I'm just acting like an obsessive. And, um, and by the way, another trait of the obsessive is that they, they are fairly lopsided type of individuals who go all into one thing and other areas of their life start to become um, unbalanced. Okay, and then the last one that we have is the, the hacker. And so this is the hacker. And that is someone who um, essentially uh, makes, makes good progress at first, um, but during the first or second or third plateau, there comes a point where they simply stop, um, stop mindful practice. And so they just stay stuck, right? So they, they might reach a fairly decent level. It's, it's, it's not so bad. And then, and then that's it, right? Nothing, nothing happens beyond that because um, it's almost like, um, you know, they, they, don't, um, they don't push themselves to, uh, to go any further. And so George says, the, uh, the basic patterns tend to prevail, both reflecting and shaping your performance, your character, and your destiny. And that's why um, I found it interesting to... Uh, just describe these. Uh, I think they're an interesting part of the book. You can see in the little curves uh, quite literally what's happening. And by understanding what the, the, the path and, or the curve to mastery looks like, uh, then you can try and create that curve for yourself and, and start understanding when you're in a plateau and learning to love the plateau, learning to find the, uh, the enjoyment and the mindfulness in each instance of practice so that you know exactly what you're... Um, what you're doing. And now, as I was telling this, I was thinking about um, my, one of my last experiments was, which was to try and learn how to day trade. Um, and so, you know, I, I lost a bit of money. I think I had gone in with something like five, five grand and I, I lost 2000. Uh, I had some, some successes and then by not following my own rules, then I, I lost some money. And, um, you know, I've, I've, I've kind of temporarily stopped. I'm thinking about quitting altogether. I, I happen to think that um, it's not a particularly rewarding activity. I can hardly find enjoyment in um, just staring at the screen, waiting for a certain pattern to pan out. Um, I think that if I was good at it, like some people seem to be, and you uh, you, you nail it, then you know there's a certain reward uh, coming from that. Um, but I've also been uh, reading about the the personal cost of engaging into zero sum games, uh, meaning a, a type of activity where for you to win somebody else has to lose, and and finding um, a pleasure in that um, you know seems to be a fairly lame activity actually. Uh, I'd rather take part in win win situations, uh, which is kind of what I what I do when I create these videos, uh, at least to my mind. And so, um, so, uh, but if you had to see it from a, from the from the uh, mastery perspective, then I suppose that I was um, kind of an obsessive and a dabbler in the sense that I went all in. I you know I got books, I studied, uh, you know I, I put in a fair amount of time, and then I tried things out. And after I would say three months or so, uh, you know I decided to just um, just stop with that. Um, I just didn't find it a particularly rewarding activity. Um, I had also read a couple of books that said that if your path doesn't have heart, you know, you just pretty much just stop, right? Um, and I, I started, for example, with Tai Chi not too long ago. And um, I mean, I can, I can just tell, I can just feel in my bones that it's the right direction. So, uh, you know, something has to give as well, right? So um, on, to, uh, on to the next point, and this is also a super important one. Um, and we're, so we're gonna spend some time on this. And that is, um, George Leonard claims that our current society is engaged in what he, he calls an all-out war on mastery. 
So he says our hyped up consumerist society is engaged, in fact, in an all out war towards mastery. Um, enticed by a dazzling array of appealing non-necessities. Every time we spend money, we make a statement about what we value. There is no clear or more direct indication. Um, and so, so this is, um, it reminds me of um, a highly related phrase. Um, so he says, every time we spend money, we, we make a statement about what we value. I've heard it, something very similar which is that with every action that we take, we are essentially casting a vote to the type of person that we want to become. Um, and, and that goes for thoughts as well, right? So um, there was, a, there was a, 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 an explanation given by, by Goenka during this Vipassana retreat that I've talked about in the past. And he says that the volition of the mind is what matters. In other words, your, your intent um, and the intent from which a thought is born or from which an action is taken is what truly matters. And I was talking about this to, uh, with a friend yesterday and she said, well, how, how do you judge whether your meditation session was successful or not? And my answer was, uh, if I sat, that's already one, one big success. And if I uh, worked my very best during that session, bringing my mind back to uh, the, the focus of, um, of uh, attention. And, um, and, I, and I truly tried my very best to follow my intent. Then it was a successful session because those are things that are within my control. So I control the input. And whether I managed to become Zen at some point or you know, reach a, a certain Satori uh, or, or um, clear-minded experience, um, well, so that, that, that's great, but I, I don't judge my um, successful meditation sessions by that standard anymore because that's outside of my control. However, the fact of me sitting, committing a certain uh, time out of my day to do this and, and to do it properly, right? So, so it's, it's, not, it's not that I go like, okay, well, I'm going to sit here and daydream until the, the timer goes off or I'm going to try to beat the timer. I have a stories about that, by the way, is, um, um, you know, so that's, that's, that's no longer, uh, you know, you're, 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 that's not a successful attempt because you just didn't put your heart into it. Your intent has to be there. So intent is what matters. And uh, that, that little um, parenthesis about the timer, uh, for the last three or four days, I have been stopping my meditation and, and looking at my timer. I, I have become somewhat around 30 seconds accurate uh, to the to, to the hour right so so i meditate for an hour and as i open my eyes and check the timer there's like 25 seconds left uh which is i i don't know how these things work but it, it seems to be a common thing uh for people who who meditate or start developing a certain amount of um uh, subconscious awareness or things of this kind very cool stuff um and so so he says like yeah so so essentially you are you are surrounded by distraction you are surrounded by uh, appeals to your money and your attention and your time that are enormously seductive and um, that appear to, ha to hold uh, or, or rather hold instant gratification. So why the hell would you bother with a path to mastery when you can just buy uh, something that you want and hell, buy it on your credit card. You don't even need to have the money to get it, right? So... Um, and so this is um, what he calls an all-out war against mastery is the, is the antithesis, antithesis ooh, that, that's a hard word, antithesis to mastery. And, um, and so that's what we're surrounded with. And um, personally, I, I, I have an opinion about this, which is it's about to get a lot worse. Um, I'm involved in digital marketing and I see the direction in which we're going is we used to have the Googles of this world um, employing teams of um, psychologists and, and UX experts and whatever uh, dedicated to nothing other than than grasping your attention and your time. Uh, this is about to go now on steroids because uh, you're going to be confronted with AI trying to hack your mind and your time and your attention. So the amount of willpower and, and uh, 
mind power that you will need to develop not to become essentially a slave of the social media and your phone as many people already are uh, is going to have to be quite significant i would say and you're going to have to be very well rooted and and very mindful to um to you know essentially not not become just somebody else's mental slave um, in my mind but here comes another equally interesting point uh, when, when we talk about this whole, um, you know, our society and how it, how it undermines mastery. And that is that um, it says life at its best, these commercials teach, as in the commercials about stuff you should buy, is an endless series of climatic moments. Okay, so, so look at the curve that he paints when it comes to this stuff, right? So look at that. Uh, so, so according to these commercials, it's just one amazing thing after the next. And um, I have to say, I, ha I have friends who try to live that way. It's just like every social media post seems to be like, oh, now I'm in this amazing thing doing whatever. Now I'm just, it's amazing after amazing after amazing after amazing. And, um, and so, well, so, you know, then, then comes this, doesn't it? It's, it's, you can't sustain that. The, the, <clears throat> the only way to sustain that is just to uh, spend an enormous amount of time um, just trying to ramp, to amp things up. <coughs> or, uh, you know, going into drugs and these kind of things. Uh, I'm going to pause this for just a moment because I need some water or I'm going to cuff my lungs up. All right, so I'm back and my lungs are still in place. Um, and so what happens when that doesn't pan out, right? What, what happens when you're trying to make your life an endless series of climaxes? Um, well, you know, you start to take drugs or you go into debt or you overeat and become just unhealthy and, and so on. Or uh, you binge watch a series or, or you game, you, you become addicted to gaming and stuff. Um, and then you know you wake up ten years later and you you realize you've you've pissed a bunch of good things away, uh, none least of which is your your time, your life. Uh, so so listen to this one. I think this is a, a very cool way to describe. It. it. Says the specific content isn't nearly as destructive to mastery as the rhythm. One epiphany follows another, right? One fantasy is crowded out by the next. Climax is piled upon climax. There is no plateau. There is no plateau. And remember, the path to mastery is about the plateau with the occasional uh, <clears throat> interesting moment in between. And um, this is highly related again to, to something else that I heard last week um, by my Tai Chi teacher. He said, um, what we're trying to do here takes a long time and it is also built from the inside out. So rather than you know, be doing MMA or doing uh, CrossFit or whatever, where you become, uh, you know, your, your effectiveness is, must be immediately shown and, um, and you become sort of buff and strong and you can, you can do all these things. Um, it's almost like the way he explains it, external martial arts and external sports are uh, focused on, you know, trying to, trying to get stuff done quickly, but also uh, it needs to show that it's happening. And, uh, and it has all these peaks, right? And whereas internal martial arts, he says, we're working with the crappiest part of ourselves. We're, we're, we're trying to raise the baseline as opposed to amp up the peaks. And so what happens when you practice this stuff is within a year, two, five years, suddenly uh, your baseline has raised and you think uh, what used to be like my peak is now is now my base, you know, so like at my crappiest, I'm here. And I find that very appealing concept actually. Uh, and it, it is a, um, in my mind, uh, a more mature way of, um, of just going about things, right? Um, I, I, I particularly, um, so I, I mean, I have no beef with, uh, with CrossFit. I think uh, it does a lot of good for a lot of people and depending also on your personality, um, it, it might be much more appealing to you. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, uh, when I listened, for example, to the, to the tenants of the sport, 
uh, the guy who invented it says something along the lines that health could be measured or should, you know, that the purest uh, measurement of health is your bodily output within a certain period of time. And I thought to myself, well, we, we are not beasts of burden, right? I mean, what about my immune system? What about my hormonal uh, uh, balance? What about all these things? You know, what about my mental balance? Uh, and, and the fact that joints are not, uh, you know, necessarily designed for, for bearing uh, uh, weight in this manner. Uh, you know, the hell with that, right? If you can produce the output, then that's the level of fitness. And I think it's a confusion uh, to say that to train for fitness uh, or rather that to train for performance is the same thing as to train for health. Uh, and, and again, it depends on your personality and even your age, right? If I, if I was in my 20s, I'd probably be, you know, or I, I certainly was uh, engaged in these kind of things. Um, but so, so this is another, another big point about this, this endless, um, this endless uh, expectation of, of climax after climax and how... Um, uh, opposed it is to the path to mastery, right? Uh, which I thought was a, another um, another very interesting point. Um, you know, then he goes into all this entire thing about loving the plateau, right? So this is the the big uh, the big thing about um, uh, about the book, and um, and then there is a probably a final point. Now that I let me check if I didn't miss anything important here. Um, no, I think this is this is kind of it. Um, but there was a there was a little page that I mar marked as um, as let's say the end of this book review, and it is indeed the chapter about loving the plateau. And I'm going to re read this quote to you, and it says again and again, we are told to do one thing only so that we can get something else. We spend our lives stretched on an iron rack of contingencies. Contingencies, no question about it, are important. The achievement of goals is important, but the real juice of life, the real juice of life, whether it be sweet or bitter, is to be found not nearly so much in the products of our efforts as in the process of living itself, in how it feels to be alive. We are taught in countless ways to value the product, the price, the climatic moment. But even after we've just caught the winning pass in the Super Bowl, there's always tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Our life is a good one, a life of mastery. Sorry, if our life is a good one, a life of mastery, most of it will be spent on the plateau. If not a large part of it, may well be spend, spent in restless, distracted, ultimately self-destructed attempts to escape the plateau. Yeah. So this, this dissatisfied restlessness that seems to be a, a characteristic um, of our minds and which has been amped up by our environment and our times is, um, is what uh, George is uh, cautioning us against here. And... Um, and the thing to, to keep an eye out for, excuse me, for which to keep an eye out. And, um, and so that is it. So that is Mastery by, by George Leonard. Uh, I highly recommend the book. I've, I've tried to pick out some of the, uh, some of the highlights and passages here, but um, it, it's, a, it's a very, very short book. Um, it has some other um, um, uh, passages here or um, let's say um, you know advice around for example things to uh, against to which you should watch out uh, it also has a few chapters that describe the um, what, what he calls the five keys to mastery um, you know so you have um, you have for example intentionality you have what he calls the edge you have um, what he talks about uh, getting proper instruction, right? So, so this is more sort of pragmatic advice. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in there, um, but it's, it's in my mind a little bit more practical and, and common, common sense actually. And whilst the, the other bits that I picked out of the book were to me, uh, you know, far more interesting and, and, um, um, yeah, enlightening, enlightening, if you will. 
So, um, so there it is, Mastery by George Leonard, the book review. And um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll call it a day and I'll see you guys for the next book. Cheers.